Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm back with David Gochran. Hi David. Hi Joanna, hi everyone. And it's been, be back. yeah, it's been ages, uh, but just a little introduction. David is the best-selling author of historical fiction, short stories, and popular guides for writers. His latest book is Strangers to Superfans, a marketing guide to the reader journey, which I know everyone is super interested in. So you last came on the show in 2014, which I couldn't believe when I looked it up. I mean, it's just crazy. So how has your author life changed since then? Uh, quite a lot, actually. It was a, it was a bit of a roller coaster. 2014 was was a brilliant year for me in terms of sales and stuff, and that spilled over nicely into 2015. But then I had some stuff going on in real life, and I, I had less time for for writing and all that kind of stuff and and promoting. And I was like, okay, if there's one thing I can focus on at the moment, if I've got less time and less emotional headspace to write books, I want to work on the craft because while I liked my first couple of novels. Um, I, they weren't up to the level where I want them to be. So I was like, okay, if I can focus on one thing over the next year or two, um, it's going to be craft. And I, I pretty much did that. And I, I, I'm a slow writer anyway, but, but all this stuff was, was kind of slowing me down. But I was like, okay, if I'm going to publish something, I want it to be better than anything I published before. So I really went down the rabbit hole of craft. I remember I did a couple of drafts just on the, on the rhythm of the sentences in, 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 in Liberty Boy because it was, it was the first book I wrote set in, set in Ireland. And it was really important for me to get especially the dialogue, the patter of how people speak, uh, because conversation is kind of like a combat sport in Ireland, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get that right, you know, and there, was a, there would have been a few Irish people watching to see if I did that. So that was all super important to me. And But there was also like elements of the craft that I've been wanting to work on for a while. So I kind of stepped off the, the, the treadmill. And when I, when I eventually then released that book, I think, because it took a while to write, because it was the first time I wrote a book which was going to be a series opener. I'd only done standalones before, and it's, and it's a different a different kind of intellectual challenge. You, you've got to set up all sorts of stuff for future books and, and all that stuff I never had to think about before. Um, but anyway, when I eventually released it, it, uh, it was a total flop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so basically what happened was there, there was a bit of a technical problem with the launch. Um, it didn't get also bots, which we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about the mm. importance of also bots later. But this happens every so often and it was just a, it was just a piece of bad luck that this particular book didn't get also bots on launch. And when you know how central also bots are to the entire Amazon recommendation engine, um, which I did, um, what I should have done was yank the book straight away, straight away and republish it. But I, I kept thinking the also bots were going to kick in in the next update, and they didn't. Um, and the other thing I should have done, you know, instead of like if I wasn't going to pull the book and republish it, was I should have just made it free for a few days and thrown a few quick ads at it, a bit of marketing money, and that that might have sorted it out. But I didn't. I, I kept thinking it was going to fix itself. And I and I put so much into this book kind of emotionally and personally that when and because there was no also bots, like the launch itself, the launch week went fine. But then it just had the dead cat bounce. Didn't sell anything after the launch week. And I, I was kind of devastated by that. And I and, and it took a few months for me to kind of, you know, um, give myself a. a uh, to get to get to get to get the kind of mojo back to start promoting it again, and once I did, then the also bots kicked in and sales picked up and all that. But there was another issue going on with that launch, which took a bit longer for me to accept internally, which was things have changed dramatically since 2014. Um, like I started self-publishing in 2011, and I started pretty well, and each year was was kind of doubling or tripling up until 2015 when the wheels came off for me a little bit, and. I'd figured out a pretty good system of marketing, kind of visibility marketing, where I was I was focused on the algorithms and metadata and getting visible in the Amazon store and con convincing the algorithms to sell the book for me. Mm -hmm. And I had figured out that formula pretty well. And I got a little bit lazy, you know, when all this other stuff started where people were working email autoresponders and Facebook ads and book book ads and AMS. I, I was just lazy. I didn't get into it. And I was kind of left behind by all this stuff. So then when I started um, getting back into the saddle properly last year and getting, being able to carve out more time for, for writing and promoting and all that stuff, um, I realized I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, so I started reading everything I could uh, about, you know, what people were doing today to market books and saw that, you know, everything had changed dramatically. And there was people kind of clamoring for me to do an update of Let's Get Visible and Let's Get Digital because it, they hadn't been updated for three or four years. And obviously so much had changed, like Kindle Unlimited just 
even even if you're wide, Kindle Unlimited has changed everything. It's mm. it's had such you know it's basically just redrawn the Kindle store completely. Um, and there's marketing has gotten so much more complicated in the last three or four years. Um, it's 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 gotten more expensive, uh, but but the rewards are greater as well. So it's it's just like a higher stakes game all around. And what I started to do is not just look at what people were doing inside the world of books, um, but also in, in the wider marketing world. Because I actually came from a little bit of a marketing background. Um, it was kind of a tech marketing background, um, which makes it especially unforgivable that I let like the skill set get, get rusty, but I did. Um, but yeah, so I, I went to a couple of marketing conferences that weren't to do with publishing or books, which is, which is kind of an interesting thing to do. And I heard... Like some of the some of the best digital marketing agencies talk about what they're doing with Facebook ads, and I started reading. I, I did a few online courses, like I got Google AdWords certified again, just to kind of um, shake the cobwebs loose. Um, I did some conversion marketing courses with HubSpot, and, and just kind of just trying to do a skills refresh everywhere because I hadn't worked professionally in the world of marketing for over ten years, and obviously a lot has changed in in the world of marketing in the last ten years. Um, but yeah, and during that process, aside from kind of trying to teach myself all the stuff that I'd fallen behind on, I, I came across this, this, this marketing paradigm of what they called the buyer's journey. And instantly, like a light bulb went off in my head. And um, I could see straight away that it would translate perfectly to the world of books. And the buyer's journey basically is where, like, because companies are always obsessed with their own sales and their own products and their own marketing and what the buyer's journey does is it forces them to view all that from the perspective of their customer instead of from their own perspective. And they, they actually put a lot of work in things called buyer personas where they, mm -hmm. it's kind of like us when we're, we're thinking about our main character or our love interest in our book. And we might fill out a character sheet, like, you know, detailing their hair color, or eye color, or their, their speech patterns or, or their, their personal tastes and likes and dislikes and to, to give us a kind of fleshed out view of that character so that when we go to write we naturally know how they would react or speak in, in various situations and marketers actually do that now with with, with their with their buyer personas they do a, a character sketch of who the people are they're actually marketing towards because you know if if you're an insurance company if if you're the customer for your product is is a senior um, or if it's a soccer mom with two kids and and and, and a dog at home, you, you might you might speak to those people very differently, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's the same with us in in the book world. Where um, if we can do a POV shift into the shoes of our reader and then examine our marketing and the whole journey they go from from when they're initially unaware of you or your books to the, the ultimate goal, which is not just to sell them something, but have them actually become the kind of fans who do the selling for you. And you can actually map out that journey and see where the various roadblocks are along the way and and, and then optimize them, in, increase mm. your conver conversion at each stage. And yeah, so like all of this kind of came came to me at once when 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 I first heard this concept and and, and I knew straight away I was like I was gonna write a book about it. But it took a while, it took it took a year on and off just just diving into the concepts and seeing how they could properly apply to, to the world of books and what mm. we're doing. Wow, really interesting. And so many things I want to follow up on there that I know um, people will want to hear. Um, before we get into the, the details of the, um, the the buyer persona and the reader journey and all of that, I want to just come back to your like what you said about the total flop, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. It's great to hear um, that, you know, and I think pe pe it's not great to hear for you, but it's great to hear for <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> Because because everyone goes through these periods. Um, but it, you mentioned there that KU has changed everything, even if you're wide. I wondered if you would elaborate on that, because there are lots of people listening who either haven't published yet or are coming or may have started in 2015. And like you said, the wheels fell off for people like us who started mm. way back and were, you know, kind of coasting on things. So just just go through a bit more like how has publishing or self-publishing or indie publishing changed um, because of that that KU point? Well, I remember when Kindle Unlimited was first launched, and you might remember this yourself, Joanna, when uh, there was a lot of argument about whether we should unroll our books and whether um, there was a lot of talk about whether it would cannibalize our sales. And, and so people were worried that if they enroll their books in KU, like they're obviously making a living or trying to make a living off their book sales, 
they were worried because you get less, you, you got paid less for a borrow. I think it was around a dollar forty for a borrow at the time, and you might be making two, three, four dollars off a sale. So it was a real worry that pe if people borrow our books instead of buying them, will we make a lot less money? And I think what we've found in the three or four years since is that borrows do cannibalize sales, but not your own sales. It cannibalizes the sales of all the authors who aren't in Kindle Unlimited. Mm. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm a Kindle Unlimited, Unlimited subscriber and I want, to, I want to get a book to read. I've already paid my $10 for the month. So all the books which are enrolled in the program are essentially free to me. But if I want to buy, if I want to read something that, that is a wide book that's not in KU, I have to pay three, four, five dollars for that. So that's that's a big hurdle to overcome. You're essentially competing against if you're a wide author and um, if you're trying to market to a KU subscriber, you're essentially competing against 100,000 high quality free books mm -hmm. every day. And not only that, um, Kindle Unlimited authors because they're getting the borrows, I believe, so not everyone agrees with this, but because I think the borrows are essentially cream on top of the sales, for every bit of marketing they do, they get that added bonus um, in terms of reads. So it's much easier for them to get ROI on any kind of Facebook advertising or BookBub ads or anything like that. And then finally, the, the third thing that really changed the landscape was the countdown deals. Because if they're, if they're running a 99 cent deal and, and they get 70%, royalties instead of 35 percent they can essentially spend twice as much in marketing and so like there's a massive difference if you're marketing a book that's in ku or wide you can be twice as aggressive on facebook you can be twice as aggressive with book web ads or anything else so putting all that together like that that is a serious challenge for for, for wide authors and i'm wide now actually with everything so um i'm wrestling with this myself at the moment but um like i the, the KU system, if you know how to work it, if it suits you and your books and your genres, like like the, the amount of money that the people at the top are making is, is pretty staggering. Mm, but I think that's really important. You're wide, I'm wide with my two main names. But interestingly, I went in, I have the third name, which since we last connected, I've started writing under another name, Sweet Romance with my mum. I co-write with my mum yeah. under Penny Appleton. And because I don't have any time to do any other marketing, I've put those three books and a box set in KU. But what's, and that's been a year now. But really interestingly, because I don't have any time to do any other marketing, I it, it barely sells. So I think it's really important that KU is not a magic bullet, right? All the stuff yeah. you're talking about in, in Strangers to Superfans and Let's Get Visible, all those things apply whether or not you're in KU. It's not like, oh, you just put your book in and then you're magically making a hundred grand a month. <laughs> yeah, no, no, like, like you, like I, books don't, don't, I like, one of the terms I really hate in this industry is the, is the idea of a sleeper hit. I, I don't believe in sleeper hits. I think that's just a lazy term for um, a success we haven't figured out yet. You know, there's always a reason. Like, like, like when Fifty Shades first burst on the scene, they started using that phrase, but then they found out that, that, that the author had built up a huge following in the, in the world of fan fiction. You know, there's always, there's always a reason for the success. Maybe we're not always able to figure it out, but there's, there's always a reason. Books don't magically get discovered. Not, especially not today when there's, when there's 7 million books in the Kindle store and like, it's just not going to happen. Um, so you always have to do something to prime the pump and it doesn't matter whether you're in KU or wide, like you, you need a plan to get sales going. You need to actively, you need to actively build up in, in every market that you're targeting because they don't spill over really. Like you, you see that with say, let, like, uh, if there's an author who's very popular in the UK and then he's trying to launch his career in the U S he, he's essentially starting from scratch. Mm. Um, you have to build up a market in each audience. And then when you're wide, then that becomes a challenge because you've got to build up your, your audience on Kobo and Apple and Amazon, but not just that, but in each individual store, you're, you're kind of starting from zero in each place, but there's advantages to that as well. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, you know, and one of the reasons I'm wide and like being wide is because a lot of these markets are growing and it's almost like, you know, starting again in these new markets where America was back in 2011, some of those markets are just starting out, you know, so I'm really, I think the long term view and those other stores take longer, but they're really important. So I want to, I want to ask you to come back on the buyer persona um, about the target, basically the target reader, because I just mentioned there I have different pen names. So I have three pen names, um, nonfiction, you know, Joanna Penn and you and I are in our also, I, 
love each other's also bots. And then yeah. I have JF Pen for Thrillers and Penny Appleton. And partly I did that because of also bots and because of branding and because of the target reader. But even that within that, JF Pen for me is really hard to market because it's so cross genre. You know, I have action, adventure, and horror, and crime, and uh, fantasy all in one name. So how do people, and you have historical fiction and books for authors. So what do you think about tar that target reader or that uh, buyer persona when people write cross genre under one name? Well, the first thing I'll say is that you did it totally right and I did it absolutely wrong. <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if, I, if, I was, if I was starting again today, I would have released the nonfiction um, under a slightly different name. Like even just throwing an, an initial in there or shortening the name like you did mm. means you're essentially, for the most part, treated as a distinct author in, in the eyes of the algorithms. You still have the danger of also bought pollution that you have to guard against, but the danger is lessened considerably. Um, it gets, it gets, so yeah, if, if I was starting again, I would do everything under separate names. I'm actually um, going to do some pen name experiments myself starting next month. I'm going to be diving into a, a new genre under a new name. Um, and actually for the last year, I've been essentially kind of divorcing myself. I've been um, splitting my mailing list in two because, again, stupidly, I had one big kind of Franken list with my fiction and nonfiction people mixed together. Um, I'm, I'm splitting my website, my web presence in two. I'm doing all these things slowly. Mm. And, and it's much better to do that at the start. Doing it afterwards is a real pain. It really is. Um, and depending on how those pen name experiments go, I may actually rebrand the historicals under a slightly different name, like just put throw in an initial or something like that, um, because it is a constant problem. And it's, it's a constant problem for, for any author who writes in two genres where one is selling more than the other, because invariably the stronger selling genre, those books will, will pop up in your also boss. And that's, that's what happens with my fiction all the time, which, which really doesn't help because just for anyone who doesn't know, um, the also boss are kind of the way that, Amazon's recommendation engine kind of takes the temperature of your book and and tries to figure out what kind of reader likes it. So if you've got scrambled also bots or books from an inappropriate genre in there, mm -hmm. they're the kind of people that Amazon's going to be selling your book to once 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 you get sales going in any kind of promotion. And often if you have bad also bots and you 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 do some kind of promotion, you will get that dead cat bounce afterwards. So but your question is slightly slightly more specific. What about if you're writing kind of cross-genre stuff under that one name? And that's where it gets a bit tricky. But luckily, Amazon's system doesn't, like, like the also bots don't decide this is a science fiction book and this is a romance book. Like, they will actually, uh, they are nuanced enough to capture that. So if you're the kind of readers, if you... If your readers are the kind of people who like Dan Brown, but also maybe with a bit more of a horror element or, or, or whatever, like the, the, the system is nuanced enough to capture that. It won't just stick one label on your book and then you're, it'll be an ill fit. Um, as long as your alt bots are reflective of your true target audience, you'll be fine. Um, so like if you've got a pretty clear idea of your ideal reader already and you know what other authors they like and what other books they like, you can target those authors and books, and I'm sure you do already, uh, quite explicitly, um, in, especially with AMS ads and, and, and BookBub ads. I, they're probably the two best tools for, for kind of cementing the correct also bots at launch because that, that's when it's most crucial when, when you're launching a book. It's, I, I, I think of it as like kind of a newborn baby with the, when the skull hasn't formed yet. It's, 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 it's at its most vulnerable at that point. Um, and you've really got to guard against um, the wrong type, kind of people buying your book. I, I actually wrote a blog post last year called Please Don't Buy My Book. Yeah, I saw and, that. And, yeah. And yeah, people took it a bit literally. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but like when, when I was trying to, like, because our natural inclination, and I think everyone does this when, when they release their first one, especially, um, they, they get all their work colleagues and friends and family and aunties and cousins and, and the postman and everyone to buy a copy, you know? And it's actually the worst thing you can do because if, let's say you're writing romantic suspense and these aren't all romantic suspense readers, Amazon's system is going to get an incorrect idea of the kind of people that like your book. And then it's going to start recommending it to all the wrong people and they won't buy it. And then Amazon's system will deem your book a loser and it's, it's hard to rebound from that. Just, just a clarification on that. Do you, yeah. do you think the Kindle also boughts overlap with the print also boughts? Um, and or the audio because it, it looks like they're not there isn't a crossover because you see people in your print also bots that are different to your kindle ones and your audio 
Yeah, I think they're separate. I think they're separate. And they're, they're, they used to be, everything used to be totally separate. Like where the international stores would, would, would have separate also bots and all the different formats would have separate. But what I've noticed over the last couple of years, and I haven't dug into this enough, is that where Amazon doesn't have enough information, like let's say in Australia, you don't have enough sales to, to generate proper also bots there. Mm -hmm. It'll just kind of import the ones from, from America. Yeah. Um, so I'm not ex exactly sure what triggers that and what kind of threshold you need. Um, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say you probably need 50 sales in, in that market before the system can start getting an accurate read on on, on localizing the all spots there. Mm. But yeah, by format, because I've noticed that myself, that, that you can often have very different um, different all different spots in, in print. Yeah. yeah, so you get the postman and your auntie and everything to buy it in print. And That's that, a brilliant idea. There yeah. you go. So you could have had, please buy my book in print rather yeah. than... <laughs> well, I know what tomorrow's blog post is going to be. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I didn't used to focus so much on print and then I got involved with Ingram Spark and now I'm just like going hard on print products and it's amazing how, like I just got my, ink. obviously we're recording at the end of the month and all the money comes in from, from all the, you know, from all the different Amazon stores and CreateSpace and, and and lightning source and I was yeah. and my create space and lightning source uh, print sales this month were bigger than my UK uh, Kindle sales which is oh, the wow. first yeah it's the first time it's ever happened so there's a little encouragement for people you can get everyone you know to buy the print book I did also want to add a clarification I published my first two books under Joanna Penn my first two um, thrillers under Joanna Penn and then I went through a massive rebrand in 2012 and re and changed those and started JF Penn and so you can definitely do that and mm -hmm. and it kind of works backwards now I want to ask you um, about just give us an overview of these steps in the reader journey as you define it in your new paradigm and then we might get into some detail on some of them all right um so the five main steps in, in the reader journey, uh, the first one is, is discovery. So this is when your ideal reader, or all readers in fact, are, are completely unaware of you and your work. You, you, they've never seen one of your covers, they've never been to your book page, uh, they don't know your name, you're nobody to them. Um, the visibility stage is when you're kind of just a blip on their radar. You're there tangentially aware of you or your books. Maybe they've seen your cover in the also bought of a more popular book in, in, in that niche. Maybe they've seen your cover in a book club email or something like that, or otherwise co come across you or your work online or elsewhere, heard a recommendation and maybe just didn't act on it yet. Um, the consideration stage is when they're actually weighing up a purchase. They're actually on your Amazon product page and they're, they're mulling over whether to buy or not. Um, the purchase stage then is when you have their money, they bought the book and it'll either sit uh, untroubled on their Kindle um, for several months or they, maybe they'll dive into it right away and start reading it and maybe they'll finish it and maybe they won't. Um, and a lot more people don't finish the book than, than, than writers know about. And uh, I think they're a bit shocked when they hear how many people actually don't complete the book, even even good books, you know, it's like less than one and two, you know, even even like award winning or hugely popular books usually have a, a completion rate of less than 50 percent, which mm. I think shocks people. Um, I presumably the really bad books have a slightly lower completion rate again. <laughs> But um, the final stage then, because you know your job doesn't stop um, just because you have their money or even if they've read your book, uh, is the advocacy stage. And that's mm -hmm. really what you're shooting for rather than reader dollars is, is to, to create an army of fans who will do the selling for you. And, and you know that, that final stage, I, I don't think we, and I, actually, I don't think we pay enough attention to any of the stages bar the discovery stage. I think anytime the sales of a book are flagging we're, we're too quick to reach for discovery solutions. We'll, you know, we'll throw, throw some money on a Facebook campaign or we'll take out an ad somewhere or we'll otherwise try and drum up publicity. And we don't spend enough time looking at the other stages. And I actually argue in the book that the other stages are, are uh, a bigger challenge in, in, in many ways, especially because we're not paying enough attention to them. Mm. Actually, yeah, and I actually pulled out a quote there. Uh, you said, uh, over time, we can fall into a trap of mistreating our core readers. And I agree with you. And I, I'm as guilty as, as anyone else. Like, you know, I feel that, uh, you know, at launch, we'd send an email to our list and, you know, kind of expect them to buy. And then we focus, like you say, on kind of the discovery um, angle and that visibility angle. So um, how, what I guess, how can we avoid that trap? And, and what can we do to not? mistreat our core readers 
Well, one one very common way that 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 authors can do it is, you know, like we're we're usually launching books at full price, and then you know a few months down the line we might apply for a book club deal or something. And but some authors can be a little bit aggressive on that, especially if the launch maybe doesn't go quite as well as planned, or sales tank, you know, in in week two or week three, or when they hit that thirty day cliff. Some some people can panic and just decide to put a book free or make it ninety nine cent or otherwise throw some traffic at it and usually that means you know running a discount on the book but that's very unfair on the people your 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 most loyal readers the the core who are on your mailing list like they paid 4.99 or whatever you're charging for the book and then like six weeks after launch you're running a sale at 99 cent it's not very fair um so that that that's a really common and kind of simple way that we can mistreat our core readers um the more complex way which i think is harder to avoid is when we just start, we just we, we just keep asking them for things without giving them things, and this is this is probably the biggest screw up I made in my career, uh, which is a very long list. Uh, but <laughs> no, but uh, like I I had the total wrong approach to email, um, and I used to advocate for it as well. So uh, it was especially hard for me to 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 completely pivot to a different approach. But like I could that was I could see with my last launch that. You know, open rates were, were were getting pretty low and click rates as well. And, you know, the conversion rate on the emails, like all the all the signs were bad. They were all getting worse. And, you know, for so long I had been saying that, you know, I only want to email people when I have a new release. I thought I was doing them a favor, you know. I thought I was, you know, didn't not cluttering up their inbox. And maybe if they only heard from me every so often, it would make it more special or something. I don't know. But um, it the problem when you combine that with releasing slowly is they they forget who you are and uh, or what they were reading or that they were interested in that series or whatever you know I think you can probably get away with a new release only approach if you're releasing regularly but I wasn't so like they could go a very long time without hearing from me um, which aside from the personal level um, in terms of deliverability in terms of you know dodging those spam filters and, and getting Gmail to put it in their inbox rather than promotions tab all that is 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 is, is really bad so people weren't getting my emails and the, and the few who were didn't care anymore <laughs> quite frankly they'd forgotten who I was you know and I don't blame them so um, I decided to, to pivot uh, to a totally different approach this year with email um, I started sending out uh, a regular newsletter. I've only do this so far for my non-fiction list. I'll be rolling it out for my my fiction list later this year. Hmm. Um, but I started doing a weekly email where I just give them things instead of asking for things. Because even even if you only email them when you're launching a book, you think you're giving them something, but it's not. It's an ask. You're asking for money. Um, so instead, I started just giving instead. So every week, I send out marketing tips to my mailing list. And there's no like... Um, it's not like some elaborate ruse where I hit them with a buy request at the end. I just give them something. I give them a tip. Uh, I've been doing like a series on bookbub ads, like I've done six or seven parts on it now. And it, it, it's not leading up to a sale. It's not, there's no bait and switch here. It's just, here's some info, some actionable, practical advice that you can use to grow your business, increase your sales, reach readers, whatever. And, and just try and give them something every week. And then what I hope is, and, and so far it's been working out pretty well, that when I do come with an ask, when I have, when I need some reviews, or if I need uh, a sale, if I'm launching a new book, mm. the response is much better because, it, you know, if you're just asking for things all the time, eventually that's go- that's going to great. Even if you're releasing books which people love, like you're you're developing a kind of relationship where um, you you you're only doing the three a.m. booty call and you're never turning up with flares, you know, and. <laughs> <laughs> that that is always going to lead to trouble eventually. You got you got to throw in flowers there every so often. <laughs> yes, there we go. Great metaphor. Um, but it, it's interesting because, and uh, we're not going to go into technical detail. But um, I'm looking. I today I've spent time on this GDPR email stuff, um, which by the time this goes out, that will be law in the EU, and you're in the EU as well. Um, and it's interesting because some of their regulations to me feel like, oh my goodness, that's really good. That I have to revisit my list because so often the years go by like I can't believe I haven't spoken to you since 2014 you know it's kind of like oh yeah that list has just been happening and I haven't even revisited it 
um, you know, or, you know, done the cleaning process as much as I should have. And like you said, one of the matrixy matrix in the matrix, and we're going to, I want to ask you about the failure matrix, because one of them is these measures of engagement, like open rates and click rates and stuff like that. So just coming back to the failure matrix, you've mentioned some of yours, which I'm really grateful for. And many authors listening feel like they live in the failure matrix. <laughs> yeah. So, And you've got a great chapter on this. So how else can we figure out what's not working? Because you mentioned there the five steps in the process. How do we know which is where our biggest failure is and, and how to tackle that? Well, this, this is this is one thing I really wanted to address in the book, because I think, you know, especially those of us who have been doing this for a while, our, our backlist is, is growing all the time. And, and you know, like we do spend most of our energy on the on the front list or on pushing that series opener or whatever. And it's, it's easy to let things slide for the kind of oldier or fustier books in our catalog. And, you know, that, that's not a bad approach. You're, I, you should be focused on, on producing new things, you know, that, that should be your main focus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think there's, there's some gold in that backlist, which can still be excavated. And I think we often forget that we, we might be tired of looking at that book cover or, or reading that blurb, but to a reader who has never encountered that book before, it's brand new to them. And we sometimes forget that. Um, so I think we could be making more money out of our backlist. But part of the problem is, especially if you have like 20 or 30 books, you're, and, and you see sales are kind of, you know, not great on, on one particular series. You don't know, you don't know where the problem is. You don't know, is, is the problem with the book? Is it the cover? Is it the blurb? Is it the, you know, is it the, is it the way I'm promoting it? Is there some, is the reader not like the ending of book two because the sell through is down a little bit there? And, and it feels like there's, there's a never ending list of things that you could potentially try. And you don't know, you don't know how to attack the problem, basically. So what I, what I was trying to do with that section of the book was give people kind of uh, a deeper understanding of failure based on all of my personal experience, <laughs> uh, but also to give them a sense, kind of develop an instinct of um, where to dive in right away so they can fix things efficiently. So, you know, if they, for example, have a promotion where it goes, like I remember doing a launch a few years ago. Um, I was launching a historical and I, I, I sold I sold four or five hundred copies during the launch week, which was pretty good. And then it just it literally went to zero the next week. And I was like, OK, is there something there's something not right here? But it was it was uh, I had it, it was a historical novel, but I'd launched it at 99 cents and I pushed it hard to my writer crowd, not realizing that was that was creating a huge problem for me. And of course, when they also bots kicked in, they were all people like Joanna Penn, <laughs> and I, I knew straight away I was in big trouble. So <laughs> when Amazon system then started recommending my book to readers, cause I had a, had a reasonably good launch. Um, it was recommending to people who wanted, you know, self publishing how to's rather than historical fiction. So straight away, um, Amazon would see the conversion rates on those recommendation e emails would have been terrible and it would have deemed my book a loser and, and, and pushed it down the rankings never to return. Um, so yeah, if you like, if you have a promotion where the promotion itself goes well, so you know that you know your your blurb is fine and your cover is appropriate for the genre, but then afterwards you've no halo, that's often indicative of a, a failure at the at, at the visibility stage, which mm. is which is what I had. So I go through each of the stages and 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 show you what a discovery failure looks like versus a, a visibility failure versus an adv advocacy failure, so that when you are looking at um, a particular title or series you can get a sense straight away of, of where the problem more than likely lies instead of having to look over everything. Cause that, that just takes forever, especially when you've got, you've got a lot of titles. Um, like if you're going to do a total renovation of your entire back catalog, when you have 20 or 30 titles, that could take you a year and, and, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, have any new work coming out. So that's not, that's not advisable. It's much better to be able to locate where the failure point is and then just be able to dive in and try and fix that straight away. Mm. It's so interesting because as I, you know, reading your book and it, it gives me a whole load of to do. So people listening feel like they have a big to do list. Um, but it's it, I love this failure matrix. I think it's brilliant. And I know, like, for example, the advocacy step, it's like you said about email. I don't know what it is. It may, is it a European thing? You just don't want to bother people. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, this kind is, of yeah. oh, and I don't want to ask. Like I don't like asking for help. Um, whereas you know some of those, um, yeah, there are some people who do it really well and have rabid fans. Um, you know, so it's it's 
it's so interesting to think about this, um, but the time as well. And I, I've been considering how much I understand traditional publishers a lot more when you go through this, because if you know, I have a, I have twenty seven books right now, and it is a night, and they're wide. So I and I publish direct on most places. So that and then I have all the different formats. So I have something like two hundred and fifty different products at this point. Yeah. Now to uh, even to update a blurb is a huge deal. So I can see how if a traditional publisher with like thousands, tens of thousands of books, you know, wouldn't be able to do this. So do, do you think um, people are, at least we're understanding traditional publishing or, you know, how is the relationship between trad and indie since when you and I first connected, it was it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, I, I think a lot of the bad blood is kind of Gone, evaporated to a certain extent, um, partly because so many authors are doing a little bit of each now, or so many traditionally published authors have come over to indie and and, and stayed indie, um, but also because we we kind of won, you know, <laughs> we kind of did. Like like uh, if you look at the US ebook market now, self publishers like people like me and you just sitting in their kitchen have taken over forty percent of the market, you know, like that's insane, that's completely insane. <laughs> so yeah, th I think that's 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 part of the reason why, yeah, because. They, I think they're still three or four years behind us in, in, in terms of marketing. And that's for their very best authors. They still make huge, huge mistakes, even with their biggest authors. Like I remember a couple of years ago when, when Dan Brown was releasing The Lost Symbol and his publisher, Random House, uh, they did something quite revolutionary for a big five publisher. They made the Da Vinci Code free for a few weeks and they advertised it quite heavily. And this was in, I think, just the last month leading up to the actual publication date of The Lost Symbol. And I was I was amazed. I was like, this is a really radical approach, especially for a book which would still be selling very well, you know? Yeah. Um, so I grabbed a copy of the book and I straight away paged the end to look at the end matter. And uh, they included an excerpt from The Lost Symbol, the first chapter or the prologue or something. And I was like, oh, geez, they're, they, they might actually be doing this right. And then I reached the end of it, and there was no link to buy the book, even though it was already on pre-order. There was no link to Dan Brown's website. There was no link to any mailing list. The only link at the end was a link to Anchor Books, which is the imprint publishing him. And I clicked on it and go to the website, and there's no mention of Dan Brown or the lost symbol. <laughs> and I'm like, you were so close to getting this right. And I was trying to think, like, you know, how many downloads would, would the Da Vinci of Code have gotten over the three weeks it was free? Probably a quarter million or something insane. Mm. I don't know. How much money do they leave on the table by not just including a link to the pre-order on Amazon or, or wherever else? Like yeah. that blows my mind. And that's Dan Brown. You know, he's going to be getting the best treatment. Out of, that's probably the, one of their biggest releases of the year. So I can't imagine what someone on a 10 grand advance what level of care they're getting if that's what Dan Brown is getting. Yeah, frankly. that's interesting. So we, I mean, we we are out of time, but I do have one more question for you because since we talked four years ago, if imagine, I hope you'll come on before four years, but it's 2022. If we're talking in April 2022, which is kind of crazy, four years from now. Um, you, you know, there's all sorts of things happening, uh, including more and more scams, which you are all amazing at bringing up. Um, we've got, uh, I was at LV, uh, London Book Fair and China Literature talking of bringing their, you know, something like nine million more books. Over. I think it was nine million authors and like a lot more books over in translation and all this different thing. So where are we gonna be in four years time and how can we future proof? Really big question. <laughs> Well, if those nine million authors all buy a copy of Let's Get Digital, I think I'll be on a very fancy yacht, Joanne, I don't know about you, but uh, yeah, I don't know, like, like, it's interesting, like, if you look, I think when we last spoke, 2014, there would have been around a million and a half books in the Kindle store, and people were already talking about, you know, kind of choke points and, and visibility and stuff, and now seven million books in the Kindle store, that's, that's a big growth, and I don't think the growth is slowing down, yeah. so I think, you know, if people are waiting for things to settle down or whatever, that's not going to happen, like, chaos is the new normal, and it's only going to get more kind of chaotic, and you're going to have to be more nimble, you're going to have to learn more things, um, which is probably not what everyone wants to hear, they want to hear it's going to get simpler and easier, it's not. Um, but uh, the rewards are going to keep growing because the ebook market keeps growing and the tools we have at our fingertips are much more sophisticated. If you, if you think back to when we last spoke, I think BookBub was already in play, but they only had the deals uh, and that was about it. You know, I don't think Facebook ads have really taken off quite yet. Um, but now we have Facebook ads, BookBub ads, AMS, and there's people moving into audio, all sorts of subsidiary stuff. Um, and 
you know, people are always inventing new ways to, to reach readers and, and that's going to continue. So as long as you don't get lazy like I did and you try and, you know, keep your skill set relatively fresh, um, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, fantastic. And I do think that the other perspective is don't try and do everything. Like you don't have to optimize everything and just be perfect. What you can do is focus in on a small area of it and like, you know, really have do that well and gain the point not 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 one percent or whatever of, of the market, which is more than enough income for people like us in our kitchens. So I think that's another perspective, as you say, like for people listening, you don't have to do everything and kind of compete on every level. Yeah, like 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 I, I I've just taken things one at a time. Like like I'm I'm pretty good now at this point with Facebook ads and I've kind of figured out a little system that's working for me and same with book book ads and ams i can't and I, I i just can't crack it i can't figure it out uh the whole system seems kind of broken to me but i hear these stories of people who are doing very well with ams ads so i must be doing i must be doing something wrong but i don't sweat it because like i have enough tools at my disposal um to 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 reach readers and i will eventually figure out ams ads and then i'll move on to the next thing but you don't you don't have to do everything at once you can take it piece by piece you can sort out your I, I would actually recommend that you know if you're going to tackle one thing if you're faced with all these things like you're like I don't know where to start I, I would start with email because you know you work so hard to get people to your Amazon page and then you know at best a quarter or half of them will, will, will buy your book and at best half of them will actually finish the book and then only a fraction of those people will sign up to your mailing list. So mm-hmm. you're, you're really winnowed down from, from, from the one million people that might have seen your, your, your ad uh, in, in the book book email you've, and you've only got a handful of them that have actually made it all the way to your mailing list. And I think it, it's so crucial to look after them because um, you've worked so hard to, to, to get them to that point and invested so much in terms of time and, and often money too. Mm. And then once, once once you have the email uh, side of things figured out, then you can kind of start working backwards through everything. And I, w- I would recommend doing that rather than before you, you start. I, th- I think I said in the book, like, you should solve all these things in, in reverse. Um, instead of starting with the traffic and pouring more money and, and people into a broken system, f- fix, fix the aftercare first and then the product and then the presentation and then start looking at pumping up traffic. And you'll get a much better return from it once everything else is, is already in good shape. Mm, fantastic. Well, um, Strangers to Superfans is a fantastic book. Um, I had it on pre-order and really found it very useful. And as I said, uh, my list has grown. But also, um, you have a great free sign up and newsletter. So tell people where they can find you and your books online. All right. So you can go to David, davidgochran.com. Can't even say my name, let alone spell it. davidgochran.com and Gochran is spelled G-A-U-G-H-R-A-N. I think my pen name will be a lot simpler than that. Um, and if you just Google me, like I'm, 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 I dominate the first few pages of results, you'll find me. But there's, there's, a, there's a free book called Amazon Decoded, which is a short 50, 60 page book explaining how the Kindle store works and all the algorithms and how to work them to your advantage. And you get that as a bonus for signing up to my list. Um, so check that out. Yeah, it's great. And that is only on your list. That's another tip, right? It's a great tip. And I need to do, you know, for my fiction, I need to do that, like write something specific. I have it for the creative pen, but really great tip and great book. So thanks so much for your time, David. That was great. Thank you very much. Bye, guys.